In June 1985, FBI investigators continued to hunt the kidnapper and killer of 17-year-old Sherry Smith. While investigators focused on the Smith murder, the elusive predator pursued other plans. On Friday, June 14th, two weeks after Sherry's abduction, a man grabbed Deborah May Helm from her front yard in Richland County as she played with her brother. She was just nine years old. The child screaming alerted a neighbor. But the woman was not fast enough. The abductor managed to slip hey. away in broad daylight. Hey. Helmick's neighbor could only provide vague information. However, the general description of the suspect and his method appeared eerily similar to the man the FBI wanted for the murder of Sherry. Richland County Sheriffs immediately contacted the task force in nearby Lexington. Within moments of that abduction, we were aware of it and began to focus on that case also. We were pretty much in our minds. Um, I think that um, everybody knew these two cases were connected. For John Douglas, the case took on an even greater sense of urgency. Deborah May Helmick's fate seemed almost certain. Once they get the urge, they're out looking for the preferential victim, but if they cannot find the victim of choice, they will go after whoever is, uh, is available. And I, that was the case here with Deborah May Helmick. News of the second abduction brought Douglas down from Quantico, Virginia to South Carolina. The FBI hoped they could find nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick before her young life was cut short. In the Smith case, the killer's phone calls had been a critical link for the investigators. It had been nearly a week since Deborah's disappearance, and they hadn't heard from him. To get him to call, Douglas devised a plan. With the help of the local media, he would set a trap. And the way that One we key that element of the plan placed Dawn Smith in jeopardy. Douglas had to ask the Smiths to put their other Dawn daughter at risk to, to catch Sherry's killer and hopefully find young Deborah. Dawn agreed. A lot of times people thought we were twins. We looked a lot alike and so they came up with this plan that if I were to answer the phone, maybe he would turn that fascination from Sherry to me. And if I could keep him on the phone talking long enough about Sherry, about himself, about anything to keep him on the phone, then they could trace the call and catch him. Douglas's strategy centered around a memorial service for Sherry. Investigators promoted the service in the local press. The agents hoped the attention to his first victim would rekindle the killer's fascination with Dawn. Douglas needed something else to bait the trap, a personal item from Sherry's room. Based on experience, Douglas knew that sexual predators are often attracted to personal items of their victims. She likes they want mementos that they can keep, even display as trophies. He noticed the koala bear. It was the mascot of the university she planned to attend in the fall. This is gonna work perfectly. The day of the memorial service, plainclothed agents swarmed the grounds, hoping their suspect would visit the cemetery. As the family's minister delivered a eulogy, Dawn and her parents huddled close though Dawn had willingly volunteered to lure the killer to the trap. The danger it presented weighed on everyone's mind. There was no telling what the suspect might do. The security around Dawn was, was heightened. We were extremely, extremely concerned about Dawn becoming a victim. Then, as planned, 
Dawn placed some flowers and the koala bear on her sister's grave. Now all that was left to do was wait. Using Douglas's profile, FBI agents coached Dawn on how to handle the suspect when he called. I was told to never be threatening, to never be harsh, to be real understanding and sympathetic and compassionate, and I was with him. And I think he liked that because he felt like he was very much in charge, which is something that he thrived on. Several calls came to the Smith home following the memorial service. Not knowing if it was Sherry's killer, Dawn had to answer every one. Shortly after midnight, the phone at the Smith house rang again. As Douglas had hoped, the culprit took the bait. And as anticipated, the killer had turned his focus to Dawn. You can't be protected all the time. He made it clear to her that she was going to be his next victim. You know, uh, God wants you to join Cherry Bay. It's just a matter of time. This month, Despite the threat, Dawn kept him on the line, enduring abuse from the man who murdered her sister while officials traced the origin of the call. Uh, Richland County? Yeah, okay, listen carefully. Go one door. Then, before hanging up, the killer offered directions. Turn right. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Special Agent John Vollmer feared that the killer would not stop there. Once the, he called about Deborah Helmick, then you're leading into the possibility that you now are dealing with a possible serial killer who has killed now at least two, you suspect, maybe others before, uh, and may continue to kill others. Despite Douglas's success at getting the suspect to call, no one had anticipated just how far away the killer would go to avoid detection. Tracing the call from outside the area took additional time. Again, the suspect left the phone booth moments before the authorities could reach him. We were very, very close to catching him on a number of occasions. And it's almost as if he sensed this and began to move further in making his phone call. Other investigators followed the caller's directions. There, they found nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick murdered. The gamble had failed. With every missed opportunity, the probability of more victims increased. And now, Dawn was the most likely target. Investigators feared the killer would make an attempt to abduct her. 